Hi, it's Joe. Joe, I just got a couple questions for you. Okay. Um, as far as your uh, your new album, what was your uh, your inspiration for the new sound in that it was incorporating more blues and uh, a different sort of mix than, than albums like Surfing or The Extremist? Well, I definitely wanted to um, move forward in time. Uh, you know, I, it, it was the seventh record for me, and I'd... Boy, from the very early record, even if you count the first EP... I, you know, I'd gone through making an, uh, an avant-garde guitar record, or maybe two, you might say, and then with uh, surfing and flying and, and culminating perhaps in the extremist, I, I, I entertained more uh, straight-ahead uh, rock and roll studio ethics, you know. And uh, Time Machine saw sort of a, a collection of my weirdest and, and most straight-ahead ideas in the studio, you know, from songs like Woodstock Jam, and some of the older live stuff and the, the first EP stuff, um, experimentations all the way to songs like, uh, uh, you know, I don't Speed of Light, you know, some real straight ahead, you know, very nice sounding uh, rock and roll instrumentals, you know. And so I guess when I started on this project, I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue trying to change with every album, but I really want to make it as radical as possible. Well, all of them would be expressions of diversity, um, but you still feel as though that they're all expressions of growth at the same time. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what really makes it interesting for me is to continually change. I like, you know, when I'm in the studio, I just don't like repeating myself um, because I, I, I have a chance to sort of revel in the past when I do a live show because I play music from the whole catalog. And I do like doing that, you know, I like playing stuff from the first, you know, six records. And, um, because you can, you can change them, or if you want, you can nail them exactly the way they were done. And, and in that way, all those records are always still sort of currently alive in, in my <clears throat> somewhat creative mind, you know. Um, but with a, with a new record, you know, once you're in the studio, at least for me, I feel the obligation to do something uh, you know, dangerous as far as my own um, creative state to try to push myself to a point where um, you know I'm uncertain and I, I have to just go on pure inspiration, you know, and hope that you know years of being a practicing musician will sort of be my right. safety net, you know. Right, right. Having been at your uh, show this Saturday. And having, you know, been familiar with your music uh, before that time, recognizing many, if not most, of the uh, the songs you played, I was just wondering um, which you think serves as a better medium, the studio or live performance, in capturing the essence of your music or the message that you want to convey? Well, um, gee, that's a deep question, really. Um, I'd say 99% of the time, the album captures perhaps the composition the best and the performance the live gig you know will capture the um, some sort of expression that perhaps is more relevant to the moment because um, you know you may write a song and three years later because of what's going on in the world you may find a new way to interpret it and it may gain relevance as time goes on um, whereas when we, when you put it out, it might be somewhat ahead of its time, you know. Um, it, it's really hard to um, it's really hard to to answer that unless let's see if I can give you a, a specific um, uh, a specific example. I'm trying to think of a a song that is, the meaning has changed perhaps a little bit. Um, or perhaps, you know, a song like uh, Crying, when we used to do that on the Extremist record, you know, that came from one completely specific emotion of mine, but the audience interpreted it in a very different way. And as years went on, the uh, the audience really used that song as, as uh, more of a uh, romantic kind of a piece. And that used to really work in the context of the, of the show, functioning as that. But when it was written of course it was it was about um it was a song about loss it wasn't about uh uh your romanticism it was mm. about dealing with death and 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 creating hope you know um so in that way you know for me the studio version really 
was the ultimate expression of the composition. But the live performance turned out to be more relevant to the way the audience perceived it. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. So, um, and so allows uh, for you were permutating it in different sort of fashion. It, ch- it changes, you know. It's the aud- once the audience gets a hold of it, it, it becomes theirs. You know? Right. Also, as far as live performances, do you find yourself um, with songs, possibly some of your favorite songs that you uh, that you'd like to perform, but uh, feel wouldn't be uh, performed correctly or to uh, to your satisfaction are you you know is, are there a lot of restraints on live performances as oh, far yeah, as what you can there always are um, especially I think in the element of um, set list because you know it would be really nice to um, uh, to play um, let's say um, a song like home I really love playing that I wish I could play that every day but we have too many slow songs in the set. If we start including, you know, like Rubina and right. uh, and Always and Crying, I Believe, um, you know, and then a bunch of stuff from the new record. So it's sort of, you have to pick and choose, you know. Um, we used to do a Killer Bebop for the first few months of this tour because we started in late October in, in Europe. Um, but uh, it... it because of how it comes out of the PA speakers, it was so different from right. the set that we, we wound up having to cut it out of the set because it couldn't be dealt with properly. Basically because it's so fast and there are so many notes that the, the mixing board had to get completely revamped just for one song, you know. Um, so sometimes there are songs you really want to do and the band likes playing them, but they, they don't go with the set or there's technical problems or, you know... I don't, it's funny how you never know that until you go out and you start doing some gigs and all of a sudden you realize you've got some things you got to deal with, you know. How can uh, certain types of restraints be eliminated based on your decision to uh, to pick different traveling musicians versus the studio musicians you used on your album? Well, um... Or can they? Well, I think if the musicians are flexible, um, then you can get a lot... You, know, you can... It, you know, it really depends on what you're trying to do I mean a perfect example is this tour where I have a I, I put together a studio band after many months working in the studio with many different musicians I get one unusual band together to, to work for 12 days we record most of the album the album takes a real left turn you know a departure from some of the, the previous albums uh, directions and that band although nails the current group of compositions and the current attitudes uh, that band has no connection to my earlier work and in a way is not really well suited to play the earlier music so I get faced with uh, a sort of a a problem who do I get that can swing with the new direction but also swing with the old direction and that's been a situation that I face more increasingly as the, as the albums mount you know and um uh, in this particular case, um, I think it really worked out to, to get back with Stu and Jonathan because they've actually mm. never really worked on a full album with me. They've always been just a live band, and their approach has always been to try to change things to their own liking to a certain degree. Um, and in that way, we have to reinterpret everything, not just the new record, but the old record. And, you know, some songs we they, they will try to nail as much as I can from the album but they do have their own opinions about stuff so they will you know we, we have to add that factor in to keep things sort of spontaneous and, and interesting for them and so in their own way they have as much well obviously they have as much influence in changing the feel of the songs as the audience might after different interpretation yeah, yeah. so uh, that's, that's it's difficult I think when you're in my position where you don't have a band and uh it's a solo artist thing, you know. Well, let's talk about that then. <laughs> Would you ever possibly consider joining a, a you know, a band that's already uh, established? Sure, I would. Yeah, but I mean, it would have to be something pretty unique. Um, you don't see that sort of opportunity arising. Well, I mean, let me ask you: who who do you think would ask someone like me? Hmm. <laughs> no, because it's easy to pose the question, but it really is. Yeah, I suppose so. Would Stone Temple Pilots call me? No, I don't think so. You know, would um, would Primus call me? Would uh, would Peter Gabriel call me? Would um, you know who would call? You know, 
when you think about it. So it's not, it's, yeah, it is. That's your actually, point. <laughs> almost close to an impossible question, you know. Uh, well, let's not try to solve the impossible. But, you know, because I never would have dreamed like, that, you know, Mick Jagger would have called me to join his band for a couple of tours. I never would have dreamed that Deep Purple called right, me. Right, right, right. And I accepted it because it was just too good to be true, you know. But uh, still, they were just tours. I didn't, um, you know, abandon my career um, to go off with these guys because, you know, I, I, I have something going that I really enjoy, so... Um, as far as where you want to go in the future, you know, looking at your uh, your you know future recordings, um, I mean, what direction are you going in? And as, as far as uh, also as far as your vocals, I mean, I know on this one you uh, put so, some sort of effect on on your vocals. Yeah, I'm singing through a uh, harmonica microphone. <laughs> Nothing high tech. <laughs> well, harmonica, harmonica microphones have a very limited. Um, a sonic range, right. and then they, they distort incredibly um, because they're, they're just basically crappy mics, you know. Um, uh, but um, well, I, I have I've had this feeling that I want to go in a more electronic um, direction. Um, I'd like to try now that I've made a very sort of underproduced album. I'd like to try to make perhaps a kind of an overproduced album. Um, um, or the, I mean, that's just typical of me. I mean, once I get something, I want to, you know, you know, once I clean up the room, I want to leave it and go to another <laughs> room, you know, <laughs> or whatever. If I mess up a room, I want to go find another one. Right. That's just my nature. Right. So, how do you think? Uh, how do you think a uh, a pursuit like that would possibly change uh, your recording uh, methodology? Well, I think it would have to radically change. Um, Maybe not as much as the way that um, I would record, but the other guys in the band. For instance, if I got together with Manu Kinshe again, um, he would probably bring the same kind of drums. But you know, I'm, I'm sure Glenn, if he was aboard, would mic them completely differently. You know, in this particular case, this new record, Glenn used three microphones on the drums, and and I mean, people haven't done that, you know, for like 30 years. But we, you know, we used one mic on the guitar, one on the rhythm guitar, one on the bass, and three mics on the drums. When he mixed the record, sometimes he only had, you know, seven faders up. And uh, some of those, the mixes that I did earlier for the album, you know, we had 48 tracks, you know, 12 guitars, 10 basses, you know, 16 track machines strictly for drums, you know, um, which is more the norm, you know, when people record, they use a lot of tracks. Um, but um you know we went we purposely went for a very organic untweaked out sound that get, that when you turn it up loud it sounds like you're standing in front of a band and they're they're not you know tweaked out right. with all with the console um very very dangerous thing to do because no one makes albums like that anymore so people you know I think a couple of people when it. they heard my album the first time they thought it was like unmixed or something they don't have to take it right <laughs> but um, that's part of the beauty of it and you get a certain amount of production value from that that is really priceless that will um, how would I put it it will it will become more attractive over time because as the trends uh, and the trendiness of current mixing begins to fade and look silly uh, my most re recent record will will remain the same you see because it has nothing on it that's trendy i mean it's got an absence of, of facts all over it and mm -hmm. uh, it will it will sort of rise up as an organic piece of truth you know what i mean uh, which is something we did on purpose for a number of reasons because of the way we felt at the moment and because of the compositions that we were using i also had versions uh, of some of the songs on the record that were totally tweaked out you know like 48 track few fully digitized versions of songs like Cool Number no. 9. Really? And uh, and Luminous Flesh Giants. And we could see, you know, we held up the two at the end, and it was obvious that the, the, the dirtier, more organic, truthful version had so much more to offer than the slick, overproduced version, you know. And it, was, it was definitely a... Um, what would you... Uh, you definitely um, a plus to be able to have two produce versions of it to choose from. Right. I mean, that's very
very rarely do you have that. Usually you're stuck with the one record you've been working on. But we actually had a choice, you know. Um, so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll have my final question. Um, this one has to do with, uh, well, I guess it's a multi-part question. You can answer as many or as few parts as you want. Um, how much influence do you have in in things such as the cover art, or or is there any significance in the whole package being untitled, um, and also image related, the new haircut? Yeah. Um, well, the hair I cut because I was tired of my hair. I'm sure it's going to be easier to sleep in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's actually funny, you know. I mean. Uh, I've had my hair really short before, but never this short. I mean, I've had it about a half inch long. But when you when you uh, when you give yourself a buzz cut like this, it's actually a bit funny to put your head down on the pillow because <laughs> hair is very kind of stuck. <laughs> right? How often do you have to shave? Um, it depends on what you want it to look like. I suppose um, if if you want to keep it looking like you know really really like as short as you can be before you shave it, you know. Mm. Um, I just use a cheap little Norelco and, and it brings it down a couple of millimeters. So I do it maybe twice a week. Um, uh, so oh, what? How is that happening? Hold on a second. Let me see if I can put you on hold. Sure, sure. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, it's the other interviewer calling. All right. So um, the haircut. What was the other question? Uh, the other was: Was there any significance to the uh, self-titledness of the album? Well, I just dropped the title halfway through the project. It was going to be called Crystal Planet, but when some of the more industrial-sounding sci-fi tunes got dro dropped, okay. then it, I started just thinking: If I drop the title, maybe it'd be easier to finish writing for the album. And then we just got used to not having a title. Uh, it was nothing overly intentional about it. And then. Uh, Record company didn't seem to mind. It didn't have a title, right. and then the cover, of course, was something we we did a, with a lot of the the uh, the photographs were all taken when the record was going to be called Crystal Planet. That's okay. There's a picture of me holding the the red thing, and then uh, the cover, the whole art thing was um, uh, was conceived. The look of it was mainly conceived by a guy who was just about to leave Relativity, and he did one last project, and, and uh, we were looking for a new look, and he came up with this new new kind of look but the photograph of course um uh just just a uh, great work by kevin westenberg who's done uh like sound garden a couple of other really cool uh, uh album projects recently um great photographer well i'd have to agree all right. <laughs> all right i'll let you get back to the other guy okay and uh thank you very much it's been a pleasure all right thank you take care